Welcome to episode 201 of the Necronama.com. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now. And we are recording this on the day of the victory parade for the Las Vegas Golden Knights who won the Stanley Cup. And I just feel like if this parade goes sideways, it's going to look like the opening of this film. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jesus, I don't even know if I can follow that one. Um, hell, even if it goes well, it could look like the beginning of this movie. <laughs> So, and of course, I'm Don Guillory, author, historian, educator, co-host of the podcast you're listening to, and uh, a general lover of of zombie films, and and that includes this one, but for different reasons. So, joining us today, Chris Vanderkay is back. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Greetings, gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me back. I always love being a repeat offender. I, you have this ability to pick films that I have never heard of. And then just like, I adore them. First, it was They Look Like People. Mm. And, and I loved that. Then you hit me with what is now my favorite werewolf movie of all time. Uh, Snow Hollow. The Wolf of Snow Hollow. And holy shit. And then, then you say, hey, check out this film. And here we are today. And I'm about to tell you how much I fucking loved it. But tell me about you first. Tell our listeners who you are, what you do. And then uh, why you picked this film, man. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you guys, if, if anybody doesn't remember my rap sheet from last time I was here, I am a, I'm a horror author. I've written a few nonfiction books about the history and philosophy of horror film. Uh, I'm also a screenwriter and a filmmaker. I'm actually in post-production on my first feature film as a director. Uh, so I'll, Thank you. I appreciate that. It's a, it's, a, it's a found footage film. It's super, super low budget, but it was a lot of fun. I was able to utilize interesting things happening in my life and my job to sort of build a movie that looks much more expensive than it ever could have if I actually had to foot the bill myself. Um, and yeah, so, you know, obviously keep everybody notified. Um, I'm on Twitter at CK Vander K is my name on Twitter and follow me there as, as things develop. But uh, yeah, I just, I love curating horror, horror and uh, you know, James, when you say I mentioned a movie that you love, that's like my whole thing. That's the reason I do any that I do. All the books that I've done have been about curating horror and trying to recommend the, lesser illuminated corners of the genre for people to find stuff that they love. So I'm always glad to hear when somebody likes something I recommended. I want you to do something we've never done here before. Tell them about the other movie you pitched me and why they should watch that as well. Yeah. So the other title that I recommended was a film called a ghost waits uh, by director. I want to say Adam Stovall. I was following him on Twitter and I heard about this movie and it was, I think the reason that people should watch it is because it's a very small indie film, black and white film about a guy uh, whose job it is to clean temporary homes in between when people are there. And he comes up against a ghost whose job is to keep people from staying there. And really? so they're at an impasse where his job is being prevented by her and her job is being prevented by him because he won't leave. And it's sort of a, a fascinating pseudo love story that's also sort of very prescient about the questionability of the American job market and what we, how we define ourselves by what we do for a living. And it's a, it's a really great film. It's another one that I think, interestingly, we kind of have a theme last time was werewolves. This time is zombies. That's a ghost film. I really like when a, <laughs> a subgenre will take a specific monster or horror concept and use it to have a, an interesting conversation about something other than that thing specifically. Love it. I have not gotten to watch it yet, but I did I, I'm a big spoiler guy. I read spoilers and I adored it. And I can tell you right now, I'm going to love it. That's why I wanted you to push it as well. Yes. Just, so. just from the description, <laughs> I want to watch it. <laughs> yes. And I'll, uh, I will rudely invite myself back. If you guys do end up watching it and liking it and want to talk about it, because it is a, it's a Hell favorite yeah. of mine in the last uh, few years. It's like I said, I want to warn everybody similar to, they look like people. It's a very sort of like low budget indie film. In fact, one of the people from They Look Like People is one of the leads in it, and he's fantastic, McLeod Andrews. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great movie, and I think it says a lot more than you expect it to for what seems is going to be maybe like a sweet supernatural romance. It becomes a whole other thing. Fantastic. All right. Um, are we ready to jump in? You want to you wanna lead the way, Chris, and tell us about the greatness of this film? And we'll just yeah, follow well, you. I mean, 
I guess the good thing about It Stains the Sands Red, it, which is the film that we're talking about this week, is that it's the easiest description you could ever give for a film. It's it's the <laughs> it's the least complicated uh, description I've ever had to give. The plot synopsis is essentially that uh, we're kind of in media res as a uh, as a zombie plague has started to spread. Something is going on, and we meet uh, a woman and her boyfriend in a car driving on a highway through the desert out of Las Vegas to get to an airport. Uh, to a, like, I guess an airway strip where they're going to meet up with some people who have found a way to get their hands on an airplane, even though everything is sort of the infrastructure is cult crumbled and things go poorly for her, shall we say, without spoiling anything just yet. And she ends up uh, losing the vehicle and her boyfriend and wandering across the desert on her own, followed by a single zombie in constant pursuit of her. Mm -hmm. And there is your plot. <laughs> Absolutely. I I just want to say really fast, I adore just how simplistic this is. Like, just somebody crossing the desert has so much going on. But you add one lone zombie, not a horde, not people jumping out everywhere, just one. And he's always, like, just a foot out of reach. And right. holy shit, it's so beautiful. This is such a great concept. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the idea of the, that's the, that's literally the inversion of the typical zombie threat, right? Like normally what we feel threatened by with zombies is that steadily growing menace of the horde that's going to get too mm -hmm. big that we eventually can't fight it anymore. It'll smash its way through the wall or there's too many to kill or whatever it is. It always comes with there being a huge crowd of sort of faceless monsters that is eventually going to tear you apart. And I think that's what's so brilliant about this movie is that it says, well, what if you didn't run into a crowd? What if it was just one? It would still be terrifying, but in a in a very different way. And I really like the way they explored it. Absolutely. And then, you know, we get all the, the great social commentary on men who won't take no for an answer. And, <laughs> and all, all this the men other in the movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. But uh but I just there's something so great. I've never thought about just one zombie, and this is what's sticking with me, obviously, because I won't shut up about it. But there's something so wonderful. Like, I want to know, like, how did he get out there alone? Like he was coming up the road. It's not like he was just lost in the desert or whatever, you know, like I want to know his story before this, but I also love, and then I'll shut up. I swear. I love that this just kicks off. We don't need right. how it started. We don't need people finding out about it. We don't need like everything that we always get. I call it the, the Batman syndrome because we always get the origin story and I, I love that we didn't do that in this ever they just went you've seen zombie flicks you know what the fuck's going on here's one zombie and yeah. I, i'm glad i'm glad you brought that up james because that was one of the notes that i put on here which was so he jumped straight to shooting random zombies <laughs> and then i put under that it's like oh they know about zombies here we go <laughs> I, yeah. I love I, I love that that was it, it's it's not this idea of dragging on with the same lore of like oh my god there was a, a you know patient zero who was infected or kind of like how twenty eight days later starts off it's you as an audience member know what's going on right uh, so we're, we're not going to waste any more of your time yeah ex exactly we're not gonna we're not gonna drag this out in fact. It becomes very clear what what Molly and Nick are doing. You know, it, you just think, okay, well, they're even if you suspended belief of like, okay, well, maybe that 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 video they showed us from the beginning, the intro is actually like where the movie's going to end because it doesn't look like things have gone crazy because neither one of them has blood on them, neither one of them looks like they've tried to escape from danger. You know, nothing like that. It's simply like they're trying to go from point A to point B. We don't know why until you have that first interaction. Where where Nick like shoots at at who become becomes known as Smalls, but mm. shoots at Smalls is like oh that's much easier than they make it sound on the news and you're like oh okay <laughs> obvious they know everything that's going on they're not you know they're not in the middle of the desert and all this shit is happening and they're going to Vegas or close to Vegas and deal with this zombie apocalypse it's this shit has already been going on and we found a way to get away from it. We found a way to 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 get out, which becomes like a, a really interesting point with with Molly and her son Chase near the end of the film, where it's kind of like, oh shit, I thought you would have gotten out. You know, she's having those conversations about her son with Smalls. What 
oh, I'm sure my son, you know, my sister is so much more responsible than I am. That's why I gave her my kid to take care of because I can't take care of him, can't take care of myself. But she's better than me and she would have gotten away. She would have gotten him to safety. And then you realize that's not how shit works out in reality. Mm -hmm. It's not always the best prepared people, the most prepared people. Sometimes, you know, to 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 reference another film, sometimes it's like Zombie Land Two, where the most clueless individual, the most ill prepared individual, is able to survive. Where they, right. you know, they they got that great scene where I think it's an ice cream truck or something is is driving by, and they realize, oh my god, it's the bimbo that we left because she was so dumb and. Uh, clueless, like it would be easier for her to run and the zombie would chase after her and then we'll get away and have no issues and you realize like she's been kicking zombie ass and surviving all this time since they abandoned her and I I love how they kind of make it, it this isn't a military operation this isn't like a rescue of somebody, I mean aside from what we have at the end, but this isn't the point of the film is to rescue somebody or perform a heist during a zombie apocalypse or have to, as you pointed out, both of you pointed out, having to survive the horde, it's simply, I got to get to this this destination. And I'm constantly being pursued, so I can't stop. And here's the reason why I can't stop. One fucking zombie. And I know what, what else is out there. So I need to get from here to there. Um, which, again, was phenomenal. A, a great way to, to, to demonstrate isolation that you feel in that type of situation. And then also this idea of you're not alone at the same time. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Because one of the things I think all the time about that they use for fear factor is anytime someone's trapped in a place, you hear the consistent groaning from outside, mm. right? The constant reminder that you're not by yourself, even though there's no there's no one to communicate with. And, um, and this movie does that on a smaller scale. But one of the things, I, I, and I agree with you about almost everything that you said there, it's, it's um, the the thing that stands out to me about this movie that I love is that it uh, while it avoids some of the cliches like the one you talked about about not opening with the origin of the you know the illness the other thing I think it does effectively is it does take a lot of zombie cliches and find clever ways to do like what James was talking about which is to use them for the larger point that the movie's trying to make which is really right. sort of about relentless unwanted male attention you know um even down to the degree that like james you're saying i'd love to know more about his backstory and, and the thing i think yeah. is so funny about the character of smalls the, the zombie that we meet is he's so perfectly designed as a standard douchebag that a girl would run into in a bar and not want <laughs> right. to know anything more about you know like down to the the suit and the long yep. hair, like the pseudo professional look, you know, he probably would have been, mm -hmm. had he not been a zombie, she probably would have treated him similarly because she would have been uh, absolutely not interested in having a conversation with him, you know? And so what they, what I thought they cleverly did was to take many of the cliches of the zombie movie and use those uh, within the framework of how do we show that this guy is a douche that will not leave a woman alone? Like one of my favorite one is li literally that they symbolically shoot him down at the beginning, but he just will not stop pursuing right. him. You know, like <laughs> it, it's perfect. You know, it's not a coincidence. I don't think that her boyfriend is a black man and that the zombie is white and the zombie pushes right past him trying to get to her and couldn't care less mm -hmm. about him or the fact that, you know, that they're a couple, you know, I think there's this, when you start to look into it, there's just a lot of really loaded imagery in this movie that has more to say than you think it does. Well, I mean, well, if, even if, if one Nick of my could watch Key and Peel, he would know that the zombie isn't coming for him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. One of, one of, it's all good. That is, that is actually my second favorite Key and, piece, Key and Peel skit. Anyway, um, no, I was going to say the other thing that's great that also fits into the stereotypical douchebag in the bar is we find out very late that he probably has a wife. So, so I mean, I think that fits into that stereotype as well. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. The 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 key piece of information that would have made her change her mind that didn't come up in conversation at any point. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's not lost on me either that though there is no one to ask for help in this world because of the zombie apocalypse, it's also sort of symbolically representative of how both a woman and a black man who would accuse a wealthy or professional presenting mm -hmm. white man will not get the help or protection or justice that they would be seeking regardless, you know? Mm. Oh, definitely. But yeah, that, hey, uh, I, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you were talking about how they use the tropes effectively as well. And I think that that feeds into what I like about the no origin. Like they're mm -hmm. trying to shoot him in the head because that's what we're told about zombies. Like, 
I like when something like zombies exists in their world. Like they know about it. They've seen movies, they've whatever. And they're trying to use these things they know. I always just find that just really great, you know? Um, and so they're trying to shoot him in the head, which, you know, leads to the scene where he's pushing Nick out of the way and all that stuff that you were talking about. But I'm just, I'm sitting here just fascinated at how much they did with these little tiny things and how much is being said. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. I mean, even, and the, it should be noted, the director is Colin Minahan, who uh, most people mm -hmm. probably know from uh, when he directed Grave Encounters with his directing partner. I can't remember his first name. I think it's his last name is Ortiz, but um, they made Grave Encounters and then Minahan directed this film and what keeps you alive as a solo director. But I give him a lot of credit because he was also able to find visual ways of getting points across too. you know, the photography of the empty stretches of desert are really effective oh, yeah. in capturing the lead uh, character, Molly's sense of isolation and just the uncomfortable continuous pursuit and how far away her escape is, you know? Um, I think all the time of like when a woman has to walk from her office to a car through a parking garage mm -hmm. or, or through a parking lot. And, you know, like that this movie is just sort of that extended uncomfortably long because almost certainly there's someone else in the building and she has to watch them and she has to carry her keys in a certain way so that they can become a weapon if they need be, you know, and, and that, that literally this movie is just reminding us that women never truly are able to let their guard down. It's just one long, exhausting journey with relatively no relief in the public sphere, you know? And if they yeah, do I, let their guard down, there's a, there's a major risk to it, which, yep. which happens in this film. Um, yeah. Yeah, more than like, once, in fact. Yeah, oh, yeah. Fire is the first one where he just comes creeping up from behind her while she was just, you know, trying to rest and, and get some, you know, get some warmth by the fire. And then he comes stumbling up on her and she has to literally sleep on a rock to get away from him, you know, on an elevated rock. I love the rock. It was so great. Just there's something so wonderful about the visual of him just down below trying to reach up at her. But there's also nowhere she can go. You know, she's she's not on like another level where she can continue up there. There's nowhere to climb to. Like she's just stuck there. I thought that was such a great visual. Yeah. And it, well, it's a perfect emotional juxtaposition for the idea of these kinds of characters, too, because when they're there and these women are protected, we get to see them laid bare as the sort of pathetic creatures that they are. You know, the guys that are this desperate to just get a woman to pay attention to them that they won't stop like that, that ridiculous sadness that like we can sort of laugh at, but at the same time in the wrong situation, she's deeply, deeply in danger from this same guy that we can laugh at in a more controlled oh, environment, yeah. you know? Absolutely. And, uh, okay. and going back to the big, the, the spacious landscape, so to speak, I, I found this so great because most zombie movies are about isolation, claustrophobia. You're always like in a house and they're right there or that kind of thing. Uh, and then this, accomplishes the exact same thing by showing these gigantic shots because you're still isolated. You have all this room, but it's not going to fucking help you in any way. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because it, it's a reversal on the expectation. Like you're talking about claustrophobia makes you feel scared because you can't get away, but this is a, a landscape that's so enormous. You also can't get away. It's sort of that same, that idea, that false, protection that people think they have because they have a camera filming that like that's going to protect them somehow. It's like, well, no, that all that becomes is a witness to your, <laughs> to your death. It doesn't protect right. you in any way. <laughs> so it becomes this false thing that ends up sort of being more cruel because of its presence, you know, like, yes, it's, it's terrifying to, for someone to invade your house, but it's your house and it's a contained space. You know, you're in a landscape now that you've never been to and everything is a danger. So it's almost worse than, than having the claustrophobia of being trapped inside of something. Definitely. Uh, one of my favorite things from a writing standpoint was how they got rid of food. I thought this was so great. She's out there for days, but she doesn't have to eat because she just has to take this little tiny thing of cocaine with her. <laughs> and she even straight mentions that as long as she's using it, she doesn't have to eat. And I thought that was so great. She doesn't have to carry all this shit. We don't have to explain where she got it all. She's got her bottles of water, some cocaine, and one tampon, and we're out there, you know? James, oh, and I'm the pack you, of cigarettes. I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, because, I set you up on purpose. Oh, uh, no, no, not just the whole way for me to say <laughs> cocaine powers activate. Um, because I wrote that in my notes. I wrote down cocaine powers activate, and I'll get into a, uh, get into it in a second uh, as far as why that that is my line whenever I see something like this. Uh, but no, I, I 
I remember taking and, and even giving those tests of students about, you know, hey, you're in the middle of the desert here. You know, you're in a, you survived a plane crash. Here are all the things you can take with you or here are all the things and you can only take 10 with you. And, you know, they would we would compete against each other to see who had the best answers as to why they would take certain things and how they would be able to survive. And this was a great way of of seeing that that riddle that that problem come to life whereas she can't drive the car anywhere because it's stuck in the sand right and she doesn't have enough time to get anything situated to where she can get away from the i mean because the zombie that smalls is 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 there she doesn't have enough time to actually rig something to set up the the car to to get out um you know if, if she had the time excuse me if if she hadn't left it um, but of course she has to get from where the car is to the airfield, which is about 35 miles, um, or 30 miles. And I remember doing the math when Nick says, it's like, oh, you're only 30 miles away. And I was like, oh, it should take you 10 hours to get there walking. If you're smart about it, which means you're not traveling, you know, when it's, when it's sun out, you should be traveling when it's dark and, uh, you know, stay on the main road, blah, blah, blah. So I'm looking at all this stuff. And then when she grabs stuff out of the bag and you see that oh it's just it's bottles of water i'm like holy shit they were smart they prepared in advance this is great because you just need to stay hydrated in the desert you can go so many you know you can go for a certain period of time without food great everything's working and then when i see the cocaine i'm like even if she wasn't using cocaine before this is a smart choice because the cocaine and the cigarettes are stimulants that then suppress the appetite to where you're going to keep on moving. And this is, I don't want anybody who's listening to this to look at this as an endorsement of cocaine or any other controlled substances. But in this situation, this movie, it makes sense because you're dealing with two things that are stimulants and two things that are appetite suppressants. So she's not going to have the, that feeling of hunger. And if she does, she's not going to notice it because of whatever she's she's consuming uh, in, in the form of uh, the, the cocaine or the cigarettes, right? But the water was was so smart to continue on taking because you were going to need that. Um, but that first bump of cocaine that she takes, I, I yelled out, and I'm glad my kid wasn't in the room, but I yelled out a line that I started, no pun intended, a line that I started using <laughs> years ago when, when, um, when I was teaching a, a film as history course, which is cocaine powers activate. And I yelled that out or write it down whenever a character consumes cocaine and has to do was something. That, was that your only note when we did cocaine bear? Actually, <laughs> I think that was it. I, I wrote down cocaine powers activate. And then I, there was nothing else I wrote down for, the, for that movie. <laughs> if I go That's back, I guarantee you, I guarantee you it's in there. Um, but no, it, 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 w- it was interesting because when I, when I would show them um, modern times with Charlie Chaplin, there's a scene in that film, in that 1934, 35 film, where he does cocaine. And it's done in such a smart way. It's kind of like, oh, this one convict is trying to hide cocaine from the warden. He pours it into the like the, the salt and pepper shaker or the salt shaker. So, uh, oh, my gosh. Um, oh, my God. Charlie Chaplin's character, um, the, the tramp then pours some of the stuff on his bread to season the bread hmm. and ends up like getting it on his face and then rubs his nose a little bit. And then he's, he's ready to fight everybody. So whenever this would happen, I would yell out the first time it was by accident. I just yelled out cocaine powers activate. My students all looked at me like the hell are you talking about? Like, and then they see what happens on screen and that just became the thing. So every time I see something like this movie, uh, something like this in a movie, I yell out the same thing because you see a way in which cocaine is used or the use of cocaine is used in order to help drive the story. So it's not just an issue of doing something with character, but also demonstrating a way in which that drug, even though it's not supposed to be assisting, but that drug actually assists in the survival of a character or the the triumph of a character, which again, I'm not endorsing it, but it does make for a great literary device to have a character do that in a situation like this. Um, because one, you start off kind of questioning their usage of it. And then when that, 
that thing disappears like it does in this film when when she drops it and because of smalls you see how her dependency is not an issue of i'm i'm dependent on cocaine you know to get high you see how the cocaine was making it easier for her to survive things and actually continue on uh walking to to that airfield that airstrip yeah well and it it does another thing that i i don't think uh it would take a sharp eyed viewer to notice, which is the compare and contrast between her level of sadness when she mm. loses her boyfriend versus her right. level of sadness when she loses her cocaine. Because, oh, she's completely distraught. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was much worse for the cocaine. And that sort of that that cleverly reminds you that um, while the beginning of the relationship we saw at the beginning was certainly better than the one she ends up with with Smalls the zombie, it was also probably not ideal. And that's right. one of the reasons why she misses a bag of cocaine more than she misses the guy that she watched die on the road that she was uh, ostensibly with. So it's another clever way that Colin has used a, a you know a plot device to sort of smuggle some characterization into the story. You know, um, and I, it's interesting because you only get so many uh, relationships in this movie. There's only so mm -hmm. many characters that interact with each other. There's a small handful, mm -hmm. and one of the things I think is great is that there uh, there is a point at which. We kind of see her get into a groove with the zombie, with Smalls, where she becomes used to him um, because she's the kind of shitty guy that she knows and can control. And it's interesting because it, it's sort of reflective of settling for a relationship that doesn't make her happy because she knows what she's getting and there's going to be no surprises for her, you know? Right. Um, and this movie does that a lot with just little pieces here and there where it just, it, it, it becomes a very clever way of using a, a framework for a different kind of story to say something bigger than what that story is actually talking about. I'm just no glad standpoint. that there was never a scene where she hooks up with Smalls and we find out that now his name is Biggs, you hmm. know? So... I, I just loved that James. she named it after having a small dick. I thought that was hilarious. So, well, well, you also have this. to throw in her her career, her previous work life. I shouldn't say career, but her previous work life, right? You get glimpses of her her background as far as like with her son, but you also get those you know, those back uh, those flashbacks and that background of her being a dancer, being an exotic dancer and a, and a sex worker, right? So, you get the impression that she's dealt with every kind of guy possible that could ever disappoint mm -hmm. her. Uh, you know, and, and I'm sure that Smalls, I guarantee you Smalls probably reminded her of a regular that would come in or some guy on a bachelor party with all of his friends saying, come on, you know, I'll give you an extra hundred dollars. I'll give you extra 200 if you do blah, blah, blah. Thinking that their money gives them access or gives them, you know, control or, or, or access to that person's body because I'm paying. Like these are the guys that would go to a, a uh, you know, one of these places that get mad because they spent a lot of money, but they could never touch the girls and not mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. that's not part of the deal. Like, that's not what <laughs> right. it's there for. It's the illusion of sex. It's not the idea that you get to, you know, you you pay for a couple of lap dances and, you know, you get to do whatever you want. Um, I'm, I'm sure those places exist. But the idea of that expectation that comes from some of these guys and Chris Rock had a really good bit about uh, men who are addicted to strip clubs and saying that they can't function. They can't function like at a regular nightclub. Like, oh, we're going to go meet some girls at a, you know, we're going to go dance. We're going to have some drinks or whatever. And these are the guys that just so soaked in toxic masculinity that when they go to a place that's quote unquote, a normal place to meet somebody, not saying you can't meet somebody, uh, you know, at a, at a nightclub, or, I'm sorry, at, at a, at a strip club or a gentleman's club. But the idea that the rules that they've applied to those situations are the ones that they've applied in their imagination with respect to going to the strip club. So the idea that, you know, I'm going with my friends, we're going to go drink, we're going to hang out, blah, blah, blah. There's Charlie, he's hanging with us. He normally wants to go to the strip club. We're at just a regular nightclub and he gets mad five minutes into it and saying, oh man, all these bitches are stuck up. Or however he delivered the lines, like it's like let's go to the titty bar, man. All the girls here are stuck up. It's like I, you know, I tried, I draw, I bought this one girl a drink. She wouldn't even dance with me. And just the idea of that money, that capital, that that whatever that resource is, is supposed to give you access to their body. And I know that that's that's got to be in the back of her mind this entire time. Of I mean, let's look, let's let's face facts. I mean, that's what Smalls wants, right? That's what Smalls wants is, is her body, wants to consume her. And right. 
he's constantly following her. And you can look at guys, predatory men is the same way. Like, I want her body. I want to have her. I just need to have that. And not taking, as you pointed out earlier, not taking no as, as an option, not just an answer, but as an option. Like, oh, my God, I didn't know you could say no. Um, and just appalled that their money, their status, their looks, whatever, whatever it is, won't give them access to the thing that they feel they are owed. Yeah, or entitled to. For sure. Well, and, and the director even doubles down on it in some ways. And I think a really clever visual way, which is that um, the character is on her period in this film. And there's a sort of a symbolic nature of the zombie tracking her because of her period, you know, reminiscent of the way that you hear alpha men all the, all the time thinking of and speaking of women in terms of serving men and providing offspring and only having these very specific and narrow roles that are all right. about how they're subservient or servi uh, servi you know, have servitude to men. And so, yeah, this movie plays with that in really interesting ways. And and that scene you were talking about, the flashback to the to when she was a, a stripper, when it first started, I was very concerned because I was like, oh, no, is this movie doing that thing where we're going to see that her past is what checkered her opinion of men, but mm. the experience of being around another man is going to, like, you know, make her realize. And I was like, and then, and then, of course, the first two dudes she runs into besides the zombie uh, basically try to rape her or I believe. Begin yeah, to one does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, before the zombie kills them, and and so I I love that the movie is not saying no. This is not her being uh, judgmental about other men because of a bad experience. It is reminding the the rest of us that this is her world experience all the time. It doesn't matter whether you're living in a zombie apocalypse or you have a job in a in a strip mm -hmm. club. The experience is it's largely the same. In fact, I, and I, I feel like because again, I always point this out when we come on the show. It's just three dudes sitting around having a conversation that is about yeah. things that are not always about us. I think it's important to remember, and I tip my hat to Colin Minahan and and whoever was the the co writer on the film. This is a movie. It doesn't. I won't say it won't do anything for women. They might watch the film and enjoy it, but in some ways, I think this movie is far more important for guys to see uh -huh. because it very effectively helps a man understand the the uh, intensity and relentless pursuit and unwanted attention that women deal with constantly in the world. And if, if a guy watches this movie and pays attention, I definitely think that he can learn something that he would not otherwise have that point of view on had he not seen it portrayed elsewhere. And because it's very difficult to get a guy to just watch a movie about a woman's experience in the real world, you extrapolate it as a zombie story and, and it's more palatable to certain audiences. But I think it actually is serving that really a good purpose, which is if a guy's going to make a story about a woman and it's a guy's, uh, how do I put this? If the guy is directing it, then it is somewhat his responsibility to be honest about that portrayal and, and um, not just of the woman that's the lead, but of the male characters that are peopling it as well. And I, I thought right. this movie did that very cleverly. I love what you just said about how it's uh, basically more important for men to watch this. I'm just going to give you a spoiler now and tell you that my double feature is Promising Young Woman. And and I bring that up because I feel the exact same way about it. These These movies aren't telling women anything they don't already know. And they shouldn't be telling men things we don't know, but they are things we don't think about a lot. We don't have to look at it the same way. If I was stuck walking through the desert to get to this airfield... That's that's the challenge, right? But then she has the added challenge of dealing with men. And and that's that's what this is about, let's face it. And and I find that fascinating because we don't think in those terms. Um I think I think some of us get better at thinking in those terms the longer that we're exposed to these ideas, the more we see these movies and and so I couldn't agree more when you say it's more important for men to watch this film. Yeah, well, and 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 to to I guess to piggyback on on both of those or that that overarching statement, um, and I hate using this person as a, as an example, but he he made a great point and he, he ended up proving that point, and that's Louis C K had a had a joke that was years ago, which I, I, again it's almost as if he was telling on himself, um, where he said you know I don't understand why women trust men I don't I don't understand how you can ever trust men you are literally going out every day, you know, on a date or living next, living with or sleeping in a bed next to a great white shark. Like they're, they're only thinking about one thing and we're, we're 
we're completely disgusting. Like the stuff that we we're into or might be sexually turned on by, or, or, or just the, the thing that somebody could get us interested over. He said, we're disgusting. We're horrible thing. We're, we're horrible beings. We don't understand how any women can trust us. And again, he's not saying that as, as a director and the team that was making this film, they're not saying that for women It's basically get to get Ben to look at and say like, well, but I don't do any of that stuff. You probably do in some way, shape or form, as far as making somebody uncomfortable, making a woman uncomfortable. And it's not even an issue of like, oh, you need to always feel bad about something that you may, you know, an awkward situation or, or anything like that. But you should at least recognize you might have been a little bit creepy at one point, you know, with, with somebody or you might have made somebody uncomfortable. You might have said something that um, was uncalled for in that situation. And it's it's an issue of you've got women that are dealing with creepy guys every day. And I just, just go ahead and say, you know, people will want to, want to say something like not all men. And I will say this right now. It is all men. All men are capable of this just horrific shit, horrible stuff at any given time. And just because they're nice to you doesn't mean that they didn't do something or make your, or make somebody else feel uncomfortable or happen to exert some type of uh, behavior that that caused somebody else discomfort. Yep. Um, so really, it, it's it's as both of you said, as far as like this is more about getting men's eyes on this, and some people will realize like, oh shit, I, I understand why she's so concerned and so cautious and whatever. And there will be there'll still be guys out there say, well, I'm not that kind of guy because I wouldn't I wouldn't do X, Y, or Z. But you're probably going to do something. Like you might be the guy who won't take no for an answer, or believes this old bullshit like. Well, you know, no really means yes, or no means try harder. And you're still living in that world where guys made the made those stupid rules for other guys to to follow, so that when women become victims of whatever those rules are, then you make some sort of claim, like in the case of of Molly, I'm sure somebody would have made the claim, well, why were you out in the middle of the desert by yourself? Mm -hmm. Why were you wearing this? Why did you get in their car? Because those are the same stupid questions that I hear people asking about women to this day. Because that moment in which Molly gets sexually assaulted, I, I wrote down uh, her reaction, which was she starts having a conversation with Smalls about her rape and says, bad shit happens. I need to deal with it. I need to move on. And you hear, or at least for me, I heard the pain and I heard so many female friends, relatives, co-workers that I've talked to about how they were sexually assaulted or sexually harassed or this whole idea that somebody it happens to somebody else. And they ask that question of which, again, question should never be asked. Why didn't you come forward sooner? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you say something when it happened? And it's because you have a lot of men who aren't willing to accept what the truth is, which is you did something vile to another human being. You assaulted mm -hmm. them. Or to, to pick up where you were going with, with Promising Young Woman, I just saw a photo of Brock Turner came up in my social media not too long ago. The idea that someone will protect them, even if, even if they do go to the justice system, somebody is going to protect them to the point where they don't want to ruin their career. They don't want to ruin their future because they quote unquote made one little mistake. Yeah. Uh, it, so, it, you, you said a lot there and it's <laughs> a, a, and it's a ton that is, that's the reason this movie is, is really powerful, but it, it, there's, there's um, how would I put this? There's ignorance is a privilege that men have, yes. that, uh, uh, particularly in my case, white men get to have uh, because mm -hmm. We don't have to face the challenges that other people do, and therefore we don't have to understand a truth about something, right? So if we decide to, we can live world in complete oblivion, and because of that, it can look to us as if other people are making a bigger deal about their problems than they really should. And uh, I always use this analogy. Like, let's say you're one of the people that thinks like a not-all-men situation, right? Nobody's saying that you're going out raping people, but uh, I would say – has it ever occurred to you that you might be walking down a sidewalk at night, 10 feet behind a woman, and because it doesn't occur to you that you could look dangerous, you're making a situation worse for her 
because mm -hmm. you're not paying attention to the fact that that is a situation that makes women incredibly afraid. And I've been in that situation yep. before, recognized it and crossed the street solely so that I would make a woman not feel as if I was a person that was following her to where she was going and making her feel anxiety for absolutely no reason. Right. Right. Now that's a small example, but it's an example of paying attention and changing your behavior so that whatever it was that you were doing is no longer feeding into a narrative that is making someone else's life worse and doesn't really make yours any worse to work around it. You know? Yeah. Right. So like th that's kind of what I mean when I say you can watch this movie and I, I, I obviously I'm not one of those I'm not one of those people that uh, that thinks that everybody is secretly a monster but I do believe that there are people even people who have good intentions that do really dumb shit all the time because they're ignorant of something or they're just not paying attention right. and that's the that's where I think people will be moved by this film is the people that are not bad at heart but are not paying attention you know. Um, those are the people that would be affected. You're right. There's always going to be people that are like, oh, this movie's about a man hater. Or, you know, this movie just wants right. to kick guys in the balls. Um, yeah, and you're never going to change their mind. But I do think that this movie can effectively reach people who are, you know, maybe attempting to be a better person, but still have blinders on about certain things. Or just, uh, you know, an utter lack of awareness that comes from the laziness that is being a white dude in society, you know? Uh, absolutely. So I, I'm curious, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys about is, did you notice, and I, I don't know if I'm reading into this, but by my math, it seems like almost all of the white men in the movie are responsible for the deaths of black men in the movie. Did you notice that? There's only a couple of black characters, and they're all killed by the white characters in the movie. Do, did you? Oh, wow. Did I you notice think that? about that at first. I, I, I mean, definitely with the, with the two, you know, escapees. Uh, they make it. I mean, they kind of hit you over the head with it. But yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't think about that. Yeah, like when she gets in the truck and they're out, you know, trying to find. I forget whatever it was that she dropped, and she moves the visor down, and she sees the two people that are on the truck before she got there. Where it looks like a, a father and son, and mm -hmm. then she sees mm -hmm. that the young black kid is wearing the hat that 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 guy is wearing now. So there's the two people that are on the truck that was killed. There was obviously her boyfriend at the beginning that was killed, and all of those lives were caught were at the hands of black or uh, at white men. And I just thought it was an interesting. Maybe not a commentary necessarily, but just it seems like they could have used any picture of any people. It seems like it was very specific intent for uh, for all of those characters to hint at the idea that misogyny and racism can be very easily intertwined because mm. so much is just about the hierarchy of where you place yourself and who you consider yeah. to be beneath you. You know, oh, I like that a lot. I when I watched it, I took it as uh, like just. It, it was just way easier for her to see that these are different people instantly. You know, it's not like an old photo where you could kind of look like, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's how I took it in the moment. But as you say that, I'm like, Holy shit, this makes so much sense with everything else they're saying in this film. And, and I do 100% now think that that was extremely purposeful. And, and same with Nick being black at the beginning, uh, just, just uh you know it goes hand in hand like you said with with the uh, women and men and then blacks and whites and like this whole thing together just it works so well and i am stumbling over words because you blew my mind thank you <laughs> well that's what i'm here for james to find the also, to find the ge the gems inside the dreck uh yeah this is a, also a fantastic because I, also because i eat too many edibles but you know i mean there's a lot of reasons so well, it's the only way to really have a conversation with me is you got to get you got to get a little altered at the beginning. I get it. Um, but uh, yeah, the, it, it's interesting. There's another moment that I thought was interesting that's about and and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I don't think so. That that, that um, in a way that her her having to care for this man child ends up being the thing that kind of brings out the maternal side in her. Mm -hmm. which reminds her of her child that she gave up to her parents. I think it's interesting that it, in some ways, the challenges that she went through with Smalls, like him just being a constant presence in her life, uh, yeah. being a problem, but also being one that she learns how to handle, you know, to deal with, ends up being the thing that almost makes her feel like she is strong enough to be the the role model and the parent that she didn't think she was. And I love the idea that... Um, like in any bad relationship, he never gets any better, but her surviving the relationship she has with him is what ends up making her stronger. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was an interesting way of framing that through the the presence of this uh, largely unchanging zombie character, you know? 
Well, plus, I mean, it, and I think I mentioned, I might have butchered the, the quote, but she makes that comment to, to Smalls about, I can't take care of myself, you know, talking about why she's giving up, why she gave up her son and, and, and just kind of, uh, you know, I, I suck, life sucks, you know, all this bad shit is happening to me because I make the bad choices and make the wrong choices, right? But when she said that, I mean, it, it was definitely one of those moments where you're like, oh, pay attention to this line. It's going to be character development. So for me, I saw it as you've been taking care of yourself since the first moment I saw you in this film. Mm -hmm. You know, so as a viewer, I see her as completely different, which is always great because whenever you're evaluating, whenever there's an evaluation, the evaluation you give yourself is not as as insightful as an evaluation that somebody else gives you. Uh, you know, just from observations as far as like, you know, you say you didn't do anything, but here are all the things that I've seen you accomplish. Uh, you're saying that this negative trait about you means this, but I've seen the way in which you've applied it. And so that's the same thing that you see with her, where she, she's down on herself because of of the situation that, that you know, she feels she created by pushing her son away or, or giving up her son, which, you know, it's, it's a really... Uh, which comes back later with the phone call where she says, oh, it's mommy. And she's like, Allie? It's like, no, no, your other mommy, Molly. And at that moment, I was like, God damn this. Oh, <laughs> yep. you've got so much shit that's going on. And you've you've told us about your son and and having the the phone to the point where, you know, you had the the played the telephone game with her with the can uh, with him with the cans. And you took your can. So you, they would always feel that they could hear you or something. So I'm sitting there like, you obviously are a mom. Like you could do it. It was an issue of you just probably felt you weren't in a good position or, or a good situation. And by giving your child away, you were taking care of them until you, until you figured out how to take care of yourself, which this, I mean, this, this is a great journey of, of seeing how somebody goes from, I, I guess an idea of, uh, an issue of self-preservation or having the idea of self-preservation to, to use, uh, I'm using this, the, using the term use loosely, but to use Nick as a way to get to safety, right? Mm -hmm. It's obvious that, you know, this is not a good relationship. It's an, it's a relationship for her that seems that he's got a plan. He's going somewhere I can go safe. And for Nick, it's like, Hey, it's another girl I'm scrolling. This is, you know, this is going to be fun. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll, I'll be able to bring this girl with me because I, I know she's not a zombie and we can have sex wherever we're going. Because, you know, that's probably what was in his mind. Um, but for her, it's she's understanding exactly where she is, what position she has and how she can, you know, get to where she needs to get to. You know, even, just the way she preserves so much stuff throughout the film and the ideas that she has, like when they come to the tires, like fuck you, I'm not carrying this stuff in the in the, in, mm -hmm. in the boat, in the inflatable boat. The zombie's following me around. So here, you know what? Guess what? I'm going to put this tire around you and tie the boat to you so um, so you can do all the heavy lifting for me. And when I want a water, I'll go back there, run, grab a water, and then go back in front and you can follow me. So just seeing the way in which she handles all these situations or recovers from these situations it's clear that there's a lot of growth within these, within these few days that she experiences to where you, you make that argument of like, no, you can take care of yourself. It's just, you haven't had the opportunity to, to see exactly what, what would, in, what would be involved in taking care of yourself. Well, and, and not only that, but ultimately what I think it kind of subtly tells us is the things that we hear her say about herself are probably not the things that she believes. We see that she's exactly. resourceful. It's the things that she has heard other people say about her. Right. Yep. Exactly. And, and that's where it reflects the idea that, yeah, it's it's dudes telling her that she's worthless that has made her start to believe that to some capacity. And when she is free of them and she's on this journey, that's when the growth happens, when she's outside of that framework of someone else telling her what her value is. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. could even be her sister. Like it could be literally anybody that she's heard this shit from for so long. And now she's alone. Mm -hmm. And the one person with her doesn't speak. Which, which I, I believe she makes mention of how that's like his one good quality. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, but I just wanted to say that in my notes, I, I actually took notes for once, Don. Uh, <laughs> in my notes, I put Smalls is the force that pushes her forward. And, and I mean on that journey that you're talking right. about, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the bigger thing for me 
was that she stands in front of Smalls when the when the military guys are there. She she plays human target for him. And then she's in the exact same position with Chase at the end when the zombies are breaking into the house. And I found that just fascinating. When you're talking about how how Smalls made her realize that she can fulfill this role. Like like she mm-hmm. literally they do the same shot. I love that so much. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to be taken away from that moment too, including the fact that she protected him against the military and then seconds after that happened, he ended up biting her anyway. Like yep. she she put herself on the line and then he still ended up accidentally biting her because he did what is in his nature. You know, it's the story of the um what is it the story of the scorpion that wants the, the ride on yeah, scorpion yeah. on the frog, you know. It's uh you know, she 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 does find the strength within herself, which is great, but she also gets burned for being willing to use that strength to protect someone who probably didn't deserve it ultimately. And so this movie's playing with a lot of levels like that. You know, the idea, like I said, he was a man child and, and, and she learned to embrace being able to care for someone, which is great, but at the same time also sort of getting screwed over for having done that to begin with, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the movie plays with a lot of very interesting levels of the experience of being uh, a woman and how to navigate. I mean, I honestly, I think, uh, there's an interesting uh, thought to be had about the idea of her protecting her son from all of the zombies that storm in the door at the end. I don't know if you noticed, but every single one of them is a guy. There's no female yeah. zombies there. And I think that's really intentional that she has stepped forward and decided that her role as the caretaker of her child is also to protect her from becoming one of these men, mm-hmm. you know? So I think that's, it's oh, most definitely, most yeah. definitely because uh, we, we were doing panels at Phoenix fan fusion and, and, zombies came up as far as like the the whole idea of monsters or metaphors uh and depending on the time period though the the metaphor of zombies can mean different things right and and the idea that it's kind of died off recently because um one of the more recent iterations of zombie films it was the the, the metaphor about immigrants foreigners you know it was, it was this idea of this this horde you can't understand was coming uh, even with the the language that's used in the news with respect to immigrants themselves, there's going to be a wave. There's a horde. There's invasion. There's this yep. right. So the all these 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 things that go into it, and um, this film, and there may be other ones as well that that I'm either not thinking of or not aware of, where it does the same thing, but with respect to to men. And I think this does a great job of of encapsulating. Um, well, actually, uh, uh, Black Christmas kind of kind of touched on it, but they weren't zombies. But the idea of you can become infected with this idea of what masculinity is, and I've, I've my most recent argument or, or discussion was with uh, a family member um, who's still kind of beholden to to old ways of of masculinity and femininity and things like that, just arguing like, oh, there's a binary: it's man and woman; it's man and woman; it's man and woman. And then my my question to this person was, well, define what masculinity is. And this person gave a definition. I said, okay, well, what makes those things masculine? Well, we decided, I said, exactly. We decided on what is masculine and what is feminine. You can get into this discussion about male and female and biology and whatever. But when we're talking about what we define as masculine or feminine or just in general, that is something that we all decided or at least people decided before us and we decided to either accept or defy. So the same thing here, you have somebody who is, who wants to take care of her child, wants to prepare him for the world, but there are all these things out there in the world that are going to probably turn him into a shitty human being as well, or just into, into a toxic male or into a guy that, other women are going to be concerned about or fearful of, or, or just be cautious of. And the idea that having or framing zombies as masculinity itself or toxic masculinity itself in this, this kind of the, the cult of masculinity is, I guess what it should be. This whole idea of the cult of masculinity of like, this is what you need to do to be a man. You don't listen to women. You don't, you know, all this toxic shit that comes up like, oh, you know, don't take no. That that just means that, you know, she just wants another drink or um, for for all. This is a, a great comparison and a horrible one at the same time. There is a documentary called um, Bama Rush or something. I can't. Oh, God, I'm going to butcher the name. up. But anyway, it's a documentary about it's, these women. It's that Bama were, Rush because it is Bama, I saw Bama you Rush. post it. OK, thank you. <laughs> 
that it's about all these people that are trying to rush these different sororities. And there was this one, one woman, one young woman in the film or in the documentary who was talking about, Oh yeah, we went out to a bar the other na- night and I got roofied and I woke up so-and-so, so-and-so. And she just delivers it no- so nonchalantly where the filmmaker then asked her like, how many times have you been roofied without batting an eye and without any connection to how wrong this was? This young lady says at least three times. It's happened to me at least three times. And the idea that there are men out there that think that this is acceptable behavior and that there are men out there that then look the other way when stuff like that happens. Or we'll then, as as we pointed out earlier, we'll then question, you know, well, why did you take a drink from him? Why did you hang out? Why did you talk to him? Why did you do all these things? And I know at least the way this metaphor is working out, the way this allegory is working out, that's probably the same thing that these writers are thinking, which is the only way to stop the horde, the only way to stop these these zombies from from expanding to to, to taking people is you got to protect them from whatever is going on to make sure that they don't turn into the same thing, Mm -hmm. the same being, the same monster, whatever it is. And you can't wait until they become adults. You have to start talking to your kids now, which again, I mean, I'm not picking on you, Chris. (laughs) You live in Florida. I live in Mississippi. Uh, James lives in Arizona. And I will tell you, Mississippi. I was going to say, nobody's really winning this one. Yeah, Yeah. that's that's what I was going to say Florida to start off with, but I'm like, I just want to make it clear. In these three states, or I should say in these two, because I can't speak for Arizona as as bad as Mississippi and Florida have been, the state legislatures have been, they are making it pretty much acceptable for men to get away with this type of shit. Mm-hmm. 100%. And, yeah. It, I mean, the, the way they're not enforcing, uh, th- and, and again, I am right outside the campus of the University of Mississippi. It is not a secret that the the police, the sheriff's department in this area, uh, as well as when when I was at Arizona State, this was a big controversy about the underreporting of sexual assault, the underreporting of rape, the underreporting of druggings, and it was an issue of we don't want those numbers out there because people will associate us with that, mm-hmm. as opposed to let's have a program where we talk about it and talk about how fucking wrong it is. And, you know, in the the choice that was made by by these institutions uh, before they made corrective action, which was, uh, which was, well, you know, we had zero sexual assaults at a certain size university. You're never going to have zero. You're never going to have zero. You're yeah. always going to have some incident. I mean, even you're, even if it's just one, you're going to have something, but it's never going to be zero. And when some schools were reporting, you know, zero numbers, it was indicative of primarily men that were at the top in in, an administrative function or as deans or as chancellors that did not want those numbers reflected a certain way. So they swayed those numbers in some cases. They swayed those numbers or argued that those numbers were representative or indicative of something else. So we're not, you you know, we report this, we're reporting two things. Yep. What all that and all that a zero tells you is is not that uh, the things have been going better. It's it's just that things have gone unreported. That's all it exactly. Means. So trust me, when I had people say like, "Oh my God, there were zero cases," like bullshit, there were zero reported. <laughs> yep, <laughs> there's never zero. Oh, and and even here, um, because I'm I'm right outside of Memphis as well. Uh, there was a lawsuit recently to from the the county or maybe the state I'm sorry, think there was a, the county is Shelby County was suing Shelby County's Memphis area and, and and the suburbs that they were suing in order to have rape kits tested and this happened as a result of uh there was a guy who killed a woman who was out jogging he was accused of rape but the sheriff's department the police department never processed the rape kit. And if they had processed the rape kit, the guy would have been behind bars and he wouldn't have raped and killed his next victim. Mm-hmm. And what it showed was this, this department, which is now uh, the police department, which is now headed by uh, a, a woman chief. The idea of that culture has not changed as far as like respecting victims of sexual assault, actually seeking uh, some type of justice on their behalf. But it was, it was, it was just kind of brushed under the rug. And it was, I mean, 
it's it was despicable. I mean, and they're not the only state, they're not the only city that's that's going through that. But the idea that we have any rate kits that have not been processed, um, you're just you're just allowing people to not only get away with a crime, but also um not that you'd be condoning the crime, but you're also allowing them the opportunity to continue to offend and, and do more things to people. Yeah. Well, and you are endorsing people not reporting it too, because by yes. doing that, you're saying it's not going to do you any good. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. and it's one of the reasons why there's a moment in this movie that I think it's a very small moment, but I think it's really powerful, which is that, um, it, it, it very effectively helps us understand women's fear in male dominated spaces because we just witnessed what happened to her with two guys in the truck. And then we don't even bat an eye. Like we're yelling at the screen. Do not go with those soldiers when the two soldiers right. pull up. Right? right. And I think that moment more than any other moment in the film is when I feel like if you are a guy watching in the movie, you should get it at that point. You should, you should completely get it. Like, this is her constant reality. Of course, she has to say no there. Could those people protect her? Yes, but those people could also be aggressors that could absolutely destroy her. And she lives every second feeling like that to some mm -hmm. degree or to some level. And I feel like that is the power of, a, of a, an allegorical narrative like this is to allow people who don't experience that for just a moment to feel that, you know, in the same way that at the end of Get Out, when the 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 vehicle with the police with the lights um, pulls up and you're terrified of what's going to happen to Daniel Kaluuya yep. until the door opens and you see it's TSA and you see that it's his friend because <laughs> you were a hundred percent certain that the person you were fully invested in emotionally was going to be shot by police officers. Right. And yep. and, and 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 so uh, while I don't think this movie is as effective as that, I think it does do a similar thing, which is to get you in that empathetic space of a character so that you can understand a single moment with clarity. And hopefully that moment will then illuminate outwards and you can use that for something, you know, you can use that to recognize something about the way that you look at it and interact with the world, you know. Most definitely. I love that. Well, who knew that we would be able to find that much to talk about, about a film about one sort of douchey zombie following a lady across the desert. Huh? <laughs> well, look, you brought up the soldiers and, and I looked at my notes. I was like, where the fuck did they get these quote unquote soldiers? <laughs> and, I, and I looked, I was like, everything is wrong with their uniforms. Like their, their, their straps aren't buckled on their helmets. Like you guys aren't going through a zombie apocalypse and they only left one Humvee behind. Come on. That attachment is not, nobody is leaving. Like you're all going to be going together <laughs> in the caravan. So I was sitting there. I was like, all right, I see what they're doing with the two guys. I get it. I get it. Yeah. It reminded <laughs> me of there was an episode of an old TV show that I really liked called Jericho. And there was a scene where some military people showed up in the town and some retired military folks in town immediately knew that they were full of shit, that they must've just like found this stuff and were pretending because they were clearly right. not military. That's kind of the vibe that I got off of this is like, she might not have known, that they weren't military in the same respect that you're talking about, but she could immediately tell that they were not people to be trusted with a position of power of any kind. Yep. Yeah. Well, and she had just trusted somebody and look where that went. So mm -hmm. I, I, even without all of that, it makes perfect sense not to trust again, you know? Yep. Um, I, I will say, I thought that we would go into this and within five minutes we would talk about a zombie chewing on a tampon and it hasn't come up <laughs> and I'm amazed. Uh, and, Look, I'm, and then... I'm still scarred, James, because when I saw that, I texted you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I loved it so much. This was what made it for me. I literally wrote Chris and I was like, I'm 20 minutes in and I'm 100% sold on, I don't even remember what she says, but it's something like, you want this, like go fetch and I yeah. was like, I'm in a hundred percent. I fucking love this. Yeah. But well, uh, and, and on more than one occasion, she says something about fetching. So like, so to feed into that sort of like men or dogs thing, you know, cause I, I literally yep. think at one point she actually takes a stick too and tries to get him to fetch yeah. it. Yeah. She oh, does. Yeah. 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 No, that, 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 that whole passage is brilliant. And yeah, I, I love the idea too of her sort of weaponizing her femininity in whatever way yes. she had to at that point. You know what I mean? Like I thought that was actually a brilliant sort of symbol, you know? Well, and it was interesting to me as well, the the whole her being on her period. I know it's not her first period, but there's something really symbolic about how she's becoming the woman that she needs to be. 
And and we use periods so much in in fiction like Carrie or whatever else about this this passageway to womanhood, right? Mm -hmm. And in this sense, it means something else. And I thought that was such a cool way to symbolize this. And then also just, you know, I mean, just one more fucking thing she has to deal with that no man would have to deal with. Yeah. How fucking great is that? And and also, yeah, like, I think not just that a man doesn't have to deal with, but that movies by and large tend to ignore. Like, we, we see so many movies, and especially survival horror films, where you could watch the every single detail of what a dude has to go through if he's trapped in the woods or whatever. Right. Like mm -hmm. if a woman is trapped in the woods, well, we don't want to talk about the icky things that men don't have to deal with. We're not going to bring those up because that'll spoil the quote unquote reality of a movie. And I think what's interesting is like when, when guys want to see a tough woman in a movie, what they mean is they want to see like basically what Schwarzenegger would do, but like looking like Sigourney Weaver while she does right. it instead of showing like, how strong do you think that this woman has to be to be in the desert, dehydrated, having her period being chased by a zombie on cocaine, right? Like that yep. is a, that is maybe the strongest character I could possibly think of given those circumstances, but because it doesn't fall into that standard framework of what we think of as a cliched sort of Hollywood tough lady that, uh, you know, like it doesn't let it, we've never seen it before because like who would write that part? Like a guy wouldn't write that part. And so few women get the opportunity to, to, you know, paint on big Hollywood canvases that you really don't see it all that much. And so I think that was another refreshing thing about this movie was literally just the moments of her remembering her career, remembering her child, dealing with the, um, the issue of being a woman and all of that happening just in the background is sort mm -hmm. of the background noise of having to live a life just like everybody else does, you know? Absolutely. And then you add in, you know, like th there was this scene, I think I wrote this to you as well, Chris, but at the end when, when she gets to the house and, and finds the kid and everything, there's that part of me that's still like, go take a shower. Not like I want to <laughs> see her naked in the movie, but I'm like, I don't want to feel that, that blood all over my chest and my face. And then I went, Oh shit, that's nothing compared to everywhere else. She's bleeding. And all the other gross things that she's feeling and she's just like, fuck it. This is more important, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And, and that really hit me because my first thought is just, ew, I don't want blood on me. Like what a male thing to say. Holy shit. <laughs> well, not only that, you, you look at that, right. And, and I, I texted you a, a picture of what I was with a, you know, with a weird face where I was like, Oh, this is me after seeing the tampon scene. Right. As a joke. But mm -hmm. I, I wrote down, I was yeah, like, yeah. this was really, this was really smart. Um, and then it's I so thought weird. about the, the idea of how men typically respond to blood in a movie, right? Mm -hmm. Blood can be everywhere. You know, if you get a Tarantino or you get an anime or, 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 a, you know, an old Kurosawa film or anything like that, you're going to have blood, right? There's going to be somebody that's bleeding from somewhere, action, whatever. Um, cocaine bear had some really good bloody scenes as well, since we're talking <laughs> about cocaine. <laughs> But if you involve period blood, menstrual blood, there are a good number of men who will shut the fuck down. Yep. And the thing is, there's no difference. It's the same blood. It's just the idea of this is coming from a place that I don't like to, to know of it coming from. Uh, right? But Don, well, yeah, how I, am I supposed to how am I supposed to find her sexy, Don? Yep. That's and, what it boils and, down to is that's not a function that a woman is supposed to have in my presence or or in my worldview, you know? And so yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. uncomfortable because it's not something I do myself and it's not something I should have to deal with from someone else. And and it also made me think of there was this really good conversation, which again is a conversation that a lot of young men need to have, or a lot of a lot of older men need to have with young men. And I'll just stick with that for for the for the purpose of this, which is in, in a scene of Game of Thrones, there was a discussion between Jon Snow and Egret where he says, oh, you know, if 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 you faint, something about her fainting. And she's like, oh, it's says swooning. And he said, oh, it's, swooning is like fainting. She's like, what is fainting? So, oh, you know, it's hmm. like when a girl sees blood. And she correct, uh, quickly corrects him. It's like, <laughs> women see blood more than men. And it dawns on him. He's like, oh, I'm fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and that idea of, Guys are always, you know, just to pick on cishet, but cishet men are always talking about, you know, blood that, oh, a fight was so bloody. It was so disgusting. Oh, this, this death match was awesome, blah, blah, blah. But 
the moment comes in which they have to buy tampons or pads, like, well, honey, can you get that for yourself? Because, you know, I really, I don't want to think about that. Or the the constant asking about, uh, yeah, how long are you going to be on your period? Just that idea of that is the one blood that typically they're disgusted by. They're horrified by. And no matter what scene might have happened in this film, no matter how bloody the scene could have been, like even when she's driving the the, the drill through that one zombie's head, the blood is okay. going everywhere on her, which is a great it's a great use. But I'm sitting there like, close your mouth, close your mouth, close your <laughs> mouth. <laughs> but I guarantee uh, uh, the vast majority of the guys who saw this, the thing that stood out to them more than anything else was her taking the tampon out, playing fetch with it, and then Smalls. Eating it. Well, because he doesn't really eat it. He he chews on it and realizes, like, this isn't the real thing. But the, the <laughs> fact that Smalls <laughs> retrieves it, and that's the fucking line for them. And it's like the two of you said, it's it's blood that's coming from a place that you're not supposed to be bleeding from. You're not supposed that that takes all the fun away from the thought of me or, or me thinking about your vagina or the fact that I can't have sex with you right now. Well, so, and I think it also comes from a place of like you know, male dominated media is when there is blood, there is violence, right? When there is blood, there is fighting. And mm -hmm. they understand that very simple one-to-one -one context. So when blood comes about in a way that is very every day, that is completely natural and perfectly normal, that's not coming from a wound that doesn't mean someone is dying. Like they just don't get it. Like it can't get their head around it because mm -hmm. as men in society, frequently they're programmed to think and feel very specific ways about things. You know, they're supposed to, they're, right. they're programmed to have, one opinion about one kind of thing. And like, they just, they can't hold two realities in their head simultaneously. And it makes them uncomfortable. And I just, there's something very funny about that. Absolutely. I also think the one last thing I'll point out that I just thought was very interesting is, did you, am I, am I the only one that noticed that when she got back to the house and she met her son, that he bears more than just a superficial resemblance to Smalls the zombie, like the huh. same hair and the same complexion. Like <laughs> it, it felt very, it felt very intentional to me that the impression we were supposed to get was that she went from man child to just regular child. Like she, mm. she, she had to rear this one against her will. And now that has made her decide or like surviving that has made her decide she wants to put that energy and effort into someone that she actually cares about, you know? Right. But I thought that was, I thought that was a very interesting corollary there without them ever sort of hitting it too hard on the head. I did not notice it, but that's hilarious. And I love it. <laughs> All right. Part do of either me, of you have? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, part of me wanted just that scene of when she couldn't, and this is just because I'm a horrible person. <laughs> uh, when she couldn't find Chase initially, I'm sitting there like, please let him be a zombie. Please let him be a zombie. Please let him be a zombie. Oh. Because in my head, I'm thinking about that inevitability of you're going to be disappointed with, with all these men. So now you're going to be disappointed with the fact that your, your son is a zombie. Um, but again, that's me as a horrible person who wanted to see it. Uh, but I was still satisfied with the ending in which it, it is her protecting her son. Yeah, well, uh, and, I mean, they the, gave you reason to think it might be going that direction because they did have the tent or the thing that he was in was closed. You right. Know, uh -huh. She was going towards it. So they were definitely setting you up for that expectation. So it wasn't like you were reading too hard into it. Well, and I like that you brought up Get Out earlier with the ending of what we expect and what we want. Because when I saw Get Out, I wanted that other ending. I was like, I love this, but... I want that ending. And then I saw the alternative ending and I was like, no, they were right. This is so much better with TSA. And, and I feel the same way with this. There was that part of me that wanted the kid to be a zombie, but that, that ruins the entire arc. And, and I'm so much happier that they went this way mm. because now she is fighting for her child. Like right. she had to go through this whole redemption arc. And it is that moment. Like, there's a couple points where she really hits a redemption arc, but it's just fully solidified when she puts the kid behind her and then gets ready to go and we get the great ending, you know? Yeah. And I think it's, it's clear to me, the movie is not validating her as a woman because she is a mother. I think no. that the, the child survives. I think what it is, is that it's validating that she was able to make a decision on her own about right. where her life was going to go, as opposed to it just being, 
her tagging along with one of a number of men to one of a number of circumstances that's beyond her control. And I feel like that's really where the power in that ending comes from and why it was more valuable that the child would be not valuable, but like more powerful that the child would be alive in the end. It was because the decision that she made on her own with what to do with her life was ultimately a successful decision for her, mm-hmm. you know? Well, and you know, I've already said on this episode, let alone the other 200 or whatever, I, I read spoilers for everything. And I did not for this. I don't I don't know why really? I just jumped in and went. And so when you say they set you up for that moment that he's gonna be a zombie, for me it was when she had to kill Smalls. Like I know he's already dead, but she has mm. to to kill him again. I don't have another word for it. And when she did that, I was like, Oh fuck. They're they're showing that she has the determination to do what she has to do. And I I was a hundred percent on board that this kid was gonna be dead when she mm-hmm. got there. Yep. Yeah, or or that yeah, or was bitten and she was going to have to figure out how to yeah. be that yeah. No, for sure. I feel like the movie was walking you to that point, but in a way effectively so that you have that massive sense of relief that that's not the thing that is actually going to happen when it comes yep. about. So Yeah, yeah I this all was around, so much you know, better. for for a small movie with a small cast that was, you know, clearly not hugely expensive, I I really think I tip my hat to like I said Colin Minahan and I think um Stuart Ortiz I want to say maybe is his yes. is his writing yep. partner. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, tip the hat to them for not only telling a story that is you know somewhat outside of their lens of experience in the world and trying to, you know, extend that empathy umbrella if you will, but also just doing a lot with relatively little in terms of just the logistics of, you know, how much money they had to spend and the the difficulty of making an independent film on this kind of scale. Mm. And it looks gorgeous. It just does. Absolutely yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. That but opening, I, I that would... opening pull back through Vegas that slowly reveals what's happening mm-hmm. in the city is, is really powerful. I mean, uh, you know, where like you see, it just looks like Vegas and then slowly you start to see the reveal of, Oh, there's a little bit of smoke coming off of this sign. And then as we pull further back, you see another little thing until eventually like the full, uh, you know, the full chaos is, is revealed right. in, in the widest of the wide shot. Yeah. I, it's I, great. I was blown away by how, how quality this is like, ah, so good. And, and, you know, earlier we mentioned like the spacious landscapes and stuff. I also just want to mention how bright this movie is again, mm-hmm. flying in the face of the usual trope and, and it works really well. Yeah. It's that's a great, great point. Yeah. Yeah. There's maybe two or three passages at nighttime and none of those are played for the kind of fear you would normally play a nighttime scene for. In fact, if anything, they're mostly played for the power of the emotion. In fact, the one thing I didn't mention was I thought it was very interesting, the juxtaposition between night one of her sleeping on the rock when he was there relentlessly pursuing her and she was terrified versus the second night on the rock where she's essentially (laughs) pouring her heart out to him and like, having it at like an emotional exchange as much as one can with someone who doesn't really respond to you emotionally, you know, mm. like where she was talking about her family and what was lost and everything. I, I think the juxtaposition of those two nights is a really fantastic uh, storytelling device to show you the development of the character just over a span of 48 hours. Right. Oh yeah. Wow. We really covered a lot with this and, sure and I, I wasn't worried. I didn't think, Oh, this is going to be a short episode. Like I just, I'm blown away by how good this was. And, uh, and I don't know. Thank you for making me watch this, but, uh, let's go to movie Rex. So Chris, you're the guest. You get to go first. If people loved this, what else should they watch? Well, I always try to think of like, what would be the angle for why you like this and then go from there. Right. And so my thinking was, what are some other movies that are zombie films, but zombie films that have an interesting perspective that isn't just about being zombies. Uh, Mm -hmm. What else? What is it saying more? And so the first one is one that you guys covered recently. makes me sad that I didn't catch you early enough to do it myself, which is Pontypool, uh, a zombie movie I absolutely love that is saying an awful lot more, I think, than most people think it's actually saying um, because it was so prescient. And then there are two other ones that I think are also very effectively about things uh, in society. The first one is a film called Hashtag Alive. It's a a zombie film I believe you can watch on Netflix. Um, It's, It's still on there. Yeah, it's still on there. Yeah. And that was a very, I think that was a great one because it's about the disconnect that people have in society due to the proliferation of being online so much, I think, about how a person has to learn how to re-socialize themselves. And then the third one is uh, the the director, Jeff Barnaby, unfortunately passed away uh, within this last year of cancer. It was sad to lose him because he made a fantastic zombie film called Blood Quantum. Uh, that was on Shutter. I think it might okay. still be on Shutter, but it's, it's a film, it, it very cleverly um, sort of, <laughs> 
proposes the idea that uh, a zombie plague breaks out and the only people that are immune to the plague are uh, Native American and uh, indigenous people in Canada. And very smart movie, fantastic cast. Uh, you'll recognize a couple of faces if you watched Fear the Walking Dead or um, uh, Rutherford Falls on NBC, uh, on, on Peacock. But uh, yeah, there's uh, some really fantastic performances in there and some of the most surprisingly brutal zombie kills that I've seen in a long, long time. Nice. I, I just want to sell Don out really fast. He just sent me a oh, picture yeah. of his list. And I didn't know the list was real. All these episodes, I thought, I, I didn't know you actually write them down. I'm so, I don't know. I, I've learned something new here, like 200 episodes in. Anyway. Um, and and so, you get to see the new gift I got for my birthday. So <laughs> Claudia gave sweet. it to me and I was like, I was like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use it. And then five seconds later, I'm like, I've got three story ideas that I put into it and saved on files and so you're never going to find random pieces of paper around the house with, with ideas on it anymore. Um, yeah, so, end of an era. <laughs> so I, I had said that, uh, that, that promising young woman was my double feature. Cause I always mm -hmm. do a double feature here. I want to throw in, uh, if you were going zombies, I would do warm bodies. Uh, oh, warm bodies one. is just, just a different take on zombies like this is. And so if you're going for that reason, that's what I would throw out as well. Uh, promising young woman, I think, should be required viewing for men. Uh, lucky as well. Uh, so any okay. of those. Um, That's a good one. And and we've covered we've covered promising young woman and lucky on here. So check those out. And hopefully one day someone will let me cover warm bodies. All right. So done. <laughs> um, I'm gonna make up a number because I know how many are on your list. Uh, Three thousand eight hundred forty-two movies. Go. Jesus Christ, it was only like 24. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, actually, it's less than that or fewer than that because uh, somebody said Pony Pool. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's why he said me because so I said it. I was like, out. son of a bitch. <laughs> 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 All right, so I'm going to go, I'm going to start with probably the most obvious one, and I'm surprised James didn't pick this, which is It Follows. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Dawn of the Dead, uh, as a, because, well, zombie movie is one of the ones I like. Um, one that James does not like, which is Army of the Dead. Uh, I don't know why. I guess he doesn't was, like. He doesn't like pure cinema. Vegas, I was I was a little worried when Vegas was at the beginning of this. I was like, oh, like I'm watching the wrong movie. <laughs> uh, Maggie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, The Crazies. Uh, only because I w as I got further into this, and as the, as the military showed up, I was like, oh shit, it's going to turn out it was like some military experiment that they got people the the virus or whatever but that again there's no explanation you don't need one uh it comes at night uh that's a great movie uh yeah. another a24 hereditary like i i saw way too many similarities between the film as far as like the the pacing and the storytelling um creep one and two or just a <laughs> creep series hopefully we'll get a third one uh mama us hush uh, let the right one in the visit one. I'm surprised James had mentioned, which was fresh that involved, you fresh. know, a person eating another person, uh, a classic shout out to shout out to Ian Lovecraft for making me watch <laughs> fresh. Yeah, it, that was a, that was a great <laughs> choice. Um, the grudge, either the original, I'm sorry, geez, I'm at the ring. Um, the ring and the grudge for that matter, a quiet place. The Ritual, uh, a movie that James swears is my favorite one, which is The Witch. Uh, <laughs> Don't Breathe. And this mm. one I included, and James knows is on the list, so it's not a surprise, because it involves somebody being chased around in the desert or being followed around in the desert. The movie with uh, Gail Garcia Bernal and uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Uh, uh, Morgan Desierto, uh, yeah. Desierto. That's a great one. I love that and the 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 same elements of fear of like am I am I safe? Am I safe? And then you realize like you're never safe or he's never safe in that film. Um I have to ask just because I like both of them but were, were you referring to the original crazies or the remake? The remake, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, cuz I I'm so, it's one of the few times where I absolutely love that original but man that remake is a banger. It was a as a fantastic movie. It it has some some interesting post 9-11 fears that I did not remember mm -hmm. from the first time I watched it that, man, they, they hit hard nowadays. And it, it's, it's remarkable the way in which that story, kind of like this one, 
you feel it's going one way, but then it kind of takes you back. Mm-hmm. The the way that that movie, The Crazies, with with Timothy Oliphant, or was it? Yep, that's him. Okay, I, I get him and Josh Demel mixed up sometimes because of a a joke from a TV show. Um, was it The Office? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you look just like Josh Demel. Yep. And then every time I see Timothy Oliphant, I'm like, it's Josh Demel. Um, but the the way in which they kind of do the same thing, which is I'm pulling you into thinking it's this type of movie. And then you realize it's this, whether yeah. it's because of the metaphors we throw in or because of things that are right in front of your face. Both these movies do it so well. And that is a that is an impressive list of movies that we just uh, strung out here, guys. Would have been better if I had Pontypool. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Pontypool is so good and so underseen that all three of us should have recommended it simultaneously. So absolutely, I'm all right with it being mentioned as I, many times as humanly possible. Look, I got I'll even go back to our episode and pull Clay McLeod Chapman and have him recommend it on this episode. <laughs> like that's that's how much it needs to be recommended constantly. <laughs> so good, so, so good. <laughs> Look, I get nervous every now and then. I, when I stumble over a word, I'm like, "Oh shit, it's got me! It's got me!" <laughs> and then you just start saying "Sydney Breyer is alive" over and over in your head to try and. Uh, I say yes. that so much. <laughs> Sydney Breyer is alive. Oh, man. I could <laughs> say it with me. Say it with me. <laughs> oh man, don't start this. <laughs> this the sigil is this? a signal. Um, so. this. <laughs> oh boy, it's happened. Guys. All right. We've lost him. So let's 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 pull this back to you, Mr. Guest. Why don't you uh you want to tell us about your books and where people can find them and anything else you want to push? For sure, yeah. Um obviously if you go to Amazon and look up my name, which is Chris Vander K, and just to make it difficult, Vander K is V-A-N-D-E-R-K, two A's and a Y, just because I like to keep people guessing. Um, but I think if, if you've liked any of the appearances I've done on here, then you should definitely check out uh, horror films by subgenre or The Anatomy of Fear, which are books that I wrote specifically about the history and philosophy of horror film. Uh, Anatomy of Fear has interviews with a lot of fantastic filmmakers. Like I, I was one of the last people to talk to George Sluise about the original Danish film the, of The Vanishing before he mm, passed away. Nice. So, um, yeah, so a lot of great interviews in there. And then horror films by subgenre, obviously we cover zombies, but there's 75 subgenres we talk in there. We talk about the uh, psychological impact of them, what are some exemplary titles in the arena, and then like elements that come up in all of them that have sort of become codified. So yeah, I think those are those are really good books that would be, if you're the kind of person that sees one movie and goes, man, that was great, what are other things like it? Those are great books to help sort of like expand that awareness and knowledge of uh, of the arena. So, uh, and you can, like I said, you can find them on Amazon and you can follow me on Twitter at CK Vander K, or yeah, CK, the letters, and then my last name, Vander K. It's my Twitter handle. Perfect. So, Chris, I want to thank you for coming on, for making me watch this, and for now being three and three, three, four, three, for making me love movies that you pick. It has been an absolute pleasure. I always appreciate you guys being willing to let me back, even though every time I come, I bring a movie you've never heard of and you still trust me. So I guess that wraps it up for another week. As always, I am James Sabata. And I am still Don Gillery. For now. And we will see you next week here at the Necronomic.com.